Good evening, and welcome to Darren Brown's Infamous. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Darren Brown. trapped inside our own heads and our beliefs and understandings about the world are limited by that perspective. I came out when I was 31, presumed that I was gay when I was a teenager, so that's 15, 16 years of pretending this huge part of you doesn't exist, of dreading the subject of sex and generally feeling like you don't fit in. And then many years later you realise you have to come out, you have to tell people about it at some point. I didn't mean you specifically just then, sorry, I was just looking, sorry, one, forgive me, I was just gesturing. One has to come out, and when you do, this is my point, if you have any, any secret, whatever it is, anything that you, that you carry around with you and you think you couldn't possibly tell people, when you finally do, when you finally summon up the courage to get this big thing off your chest, you realise people don't care. They don't care, not really, not even your best friends in the nicest way, don't really care because they are also trapped inside their own heads. They are the centre of their own worlds, and stuff you're saying to them is just some information about you, really. It's all that is like what I'm telling you now. It's, it's big stuff for me, for you, it's just some information about me. The novelist David Foster Wallace said, brilliantly, I think, you'll worry a lot less about what other people think of you when you realise how seldom they do. It's very good, but we're terrible at realising what goes on in other people's heads because we are trapped inside our own, and one consequence of that is that we're particularly bad at realising how fundamentally similar we all are. So if you're in your 30s, I'm talking to you now. There'll be concerns that you might have or uh, issues that you might be facing, which you may feel just apply to you. The comforting reality is they apply to pretty much everybody in their 30s. Women in that age group, you'll have started going to the doctors more often. And men, very common, particularly in your later 30s, to feel stuck in a rut and to fear the possibility of an extramarital affair. And statistically, in an audience this size, 13 of you will be having an affair right now. <laughs> 13 of you. I don't mean right now, right this second. <laughs> but for, although there is something going on up the top. Can't quite tell what it is. But 13 of you, and these are real patterns of behaviour. There are similar patterns for people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and so on throughout life. So if I were a psychic, which I am not, or if I claim to have special powers, which I really don't, I could use that kind of information to seemingly know a lot about you or give somebody a, a powerful reading. So imagine you've come to see me and I'm a stage psychic. And I say that I'm picking up some kind of psychic vibration from somebody in the audience and I say it's, uh, uh, it's a lady. Uh, and actually, could you, I promise I won't ask you off on stage, could you just put your hand up if you are a lady? Just so we can see how it works out in terms of numbers. So please do this on the balconies as well and right up at the top of the back. Keep your hands up as long as this continues to apply to you, all right? So let's say I'm sensing it's a lady and uh, sort of a young, youngish lady, sort of around 20, that kind of age, and, uh, and I'm sensing your name begins with um, an F. It's a random letter, but it'll just help narrow you down. So keep your hands up as long as this has continued to apply to you, right? Now, in the dark, it can feel a bit special. I think he's talking to me. <laughs> Whereas the reality is, if do keep your hands up, if we just bring the lights up for a moment, we bring the lights up, if you look around you, you should see in the nicest way, nothing special happening at all. Just a bunch of Fs sat in the dark. Could you stand up if you've got your hand up? Could you stand up? One, two, three, four, okay, so, so yeah, it's good. Right, a good number of you. Anybody on these other balconies? Yeah, hello, great. Could you stand up? We'll get a microphone to you. This is on the upper circle. The rest of you can sit down. I think I'll just talk to this lady here, but thank you so much for standing. What's your name? Faye. Faye, nice to meet you, Faye. If you don't mind me asking, how old are you? 20. 20. Have you got any pets? Yeah. What have you got? D don't say their names, just like dogs, cats, whatever they are, it's fine. Dogs. Dogs, what breed? Uh, staff. Staff, okay, good. You said dogs, is that two? Yeah. Did you name them both yourself? Uh, family name. Family name them, okay. All right, how long ago did they name them? Roughly, what are we talking about? Like a few years ago? Uh, about 10, 11 years ago. 10, 11 years ago. Okay, what do your parents do for a living? Or at least what were they doing back then? Uh, hairdresser and electrician. Hairdresser and electrician, okay, good. Okay, the dog's male, female, one of each? Female. Okay, both female? Yeah. All right, now listen, I, you're going to tell me the name of one of the dogs, 
and I'm going to work out what they would have called the other dog, all right? So if, if you think of both of the names, if you think one of them is maybe a little more obvious than the other one, then give me that one so I can work out the, the more unusual one, all right? Uh, so take your time, but just give me, give me the name of one of the dogs. Ebby. Ebby? Yeah. E-B-B-Y? E-B-B-I. A-E-B-B-I. Maybe short for Ebony, is it a black yeah. dog? Okay, all right, good. So this will be the name of the other one. All right, and it's a female? Yeah. Okay, and they name both of them together. All right, just imagine you are calling this dog to you. Imagine you're calling the dog to you. All right, now as you do that, uh, just keep repeating the name in your mind again and again. And the lips remain sort of quite relaxed, importantly, so we know there's no sort of plosive sounds or um, like P's or B's or anything that would bring the lips together. Uh, so keep repeating the names. No, it's also at the front of the mouth, so you've got like an N or a T maybe, and I think we're starting with a S, a S sound or a Z. Oh, there you go, careful. Uh, <laughs> you don't need to say yes, that's okay. I'll uh, work it out. I appreciate the help, just takes the challenge out of it somewhat. So. <laughs> Uh, oh, there you go, back up there again. So just keep repeating the name, just shout the name, Not, nothing out loud, but in your mind, just shout the name like you're screaming, screaming to this dog to come to you, right? Louder and louder until you are... Oh, no, they uh, called it Xena. <laughs> Xena with an X, like the princess... Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you very much indeed, great, take a seat. Well done, thank you. Okay. So... Thank you so much. So this is... This is genuinely specific information, right? Not just things that would apply to everybody. So let's keep this really specific. Put your hands up now if you're a man aged between 28 and 35. Put your hands up. Keep them up if you are in the earning group 20 to 50K. And then keep them up if you've been in a relationship for at least two years. Otherwise, drop your hands. All right? Good. OK, we get the lights up. Let's choose one of you. I'm going to choose from downstairs. So upstairs, you may drop your hands. I'll come to you in a moment. Uh, let's keep your hands up downstairs. All right, wave your hands so I can see you, so I can see more clearly. OK, all right. I want to get this over this side. So can somebody get it to somebody with a hand up? Doesn't have to be the person nearest you. Just take a look around you. Get it to somebody with a hand up. Uh, OK, could you stand up for me, sir? There's a microphone there. Rest if you can drop your hands. Let me talk to this gentleman. All right, great. What's your name, sir? Nick. Nick. OK, Nick. So we're going to go really specific, Nick. I want you to think of a word, an English word, ideally at least at least four letters, but it doesn't have to be. If you want to go shorter, that's up to you. But have you got something? Yep. Yep? OK. Now, whatever you're thinking of, Nick, is the first word that's just come into your head. And I've just stood you up in front of 2,000 people and asked you to do that. I don't want you going home later saying to yourself, he, he just put me on the spot. I didn't get a chance to think. I bet everyone just thinks of the same word. So right now, Nick, is when you change your mind again and again and again so you don't have that excuse later on. All right? You can imagine, if you like, you're looking through a dictionary. Uh, <clears throat> maybe you come across an unusual word, maybe not too unusual. Maybe that in itself would be quite predictable. Just take your time. Uh, have a look through it. You've got 26 letters of the, to look through. Take your time. Until you come across a word you're absolutely happy that you, I could not just rely on everybody thinking of. Have you got something in your mind now? Change your mind as many times as you like. Yes? Yeah, I'm happy. OK, there's a guy with a pen and paper just there. Two things, Nick. You're going to write this word down nice and large and clearly, please, because we are going to show it around. But, Nick, really importantly, don't let anybody see what you write. Stick it in the envelope when you're done. Thank you. So this is really specific, right? Even more specific than a pet's name. Uh, which actually just reminds me of something. I'll, uh, let me just show you this briefly, just while Nick's writing his word down. Can I get this to a lady on or near the aisle? Somewhere over here. So, lady on or near the aisle. Somebody... Sorry. <laughs> just pass it around. So it's a lady on or near the aisle. Thank you. Somebody stand up with it. Hello, what's your name, madam? Amanda. Amanda, nice to meet you. Do you, know, do you have a mobile phone number? That, do you know it off by heart? Yes. Yes, could you write it down for me? There's a guy with a yeah. pen and paper there. Gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do it. People waste so much time. Um, don't, Amanda, don't let anybody see. Just write it down, fold it up, put it in your pocket when you're done. I saw a psychic do this. I always go and see psychic shows when I can. This one was up above a pub, packed out with people in their 60s and 70s which is maybe why this flew past them. But the psychic asked a lady to write down her mobile phone number, fold it up, put it in a pocket without anybody seeing. Are you doing that for me, Amanda? Is it out of the way? Yep, lovely, thank you. And she said it was a test, that the spirits would be able to tell what the phone number was. Well, it was just a bit odd, but, you know, it kind of made sense, so I was intrigued. So could you stay standing for me, Amanda, if you don't mind? Thank you. So just get that right out of the way in your pocket or something if you've got one. Thank you. So she... And obviously, you know, you try not to be um, judgmental or, you know, but you try and keep an open mind. But I swear to God, she goes... Um, she goes, <sighs> all right, love, I'm getting your grandma. She's coming through. <laughs> Does actually sound like it, I've said that out loud. <laughs> I'm getting your grandma, love. She's giving me a phone number as proof that she's coming through. All right, she's saying, <sighs> she's saying, she's giving me an O. She's saying there's an O at the start of the number. Is that right? Is that right, love? Yeah. Is there an air at the start? Thank you. Just passing it on, whatever comes through. She's saying, 
She, oh, she was a right chatterbox, so she's giving me another number. She's saying... Thanks. So she's saying a seven. She's saying 07 at the start. Is that right? Yes. Is there an 07 at the start? Thank you very much. She's... She is... She, no, she's fading away now, love. She's fading away, Petal. <laughs> but that's something you can take away with for yourself. That's £40. Pounds. You can sit yourself back down. Thank you. I swear it was pathetic. Sorry, thank you so much, Amanda. It was truly embarrassing. Did that give you enough time? Nick, to write your word down. It did, yes. Yes? Yes, it did. Yes? OK, have you put it in the envelope? Yes. Yes, good, because I also have an envelope. <laughs> OK, so, Nick, can you get yourself to the bottom of the stairs on this side? Just push past the camera, people, over there for me. And can someone who doesn't mind just reading something out briefly just nip up on the stage? Anyone that fancies coming up, quick as you can. Somebody come up here. It's going to be you, I think. What's your name, sir? Luke. Luke, give Luke a hand. I've become Luke. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice to meet you, Luke. Can you take this off my back? Can you take it off my back? Thank you. Pull it off. Pull it, pull it, pull it. Come stand here. Come stand there for me, Nick. Just there. Uh, no, Luke, rather, Luke. Uh, Nick's over there. Right, Luke, just here. Could you take it out? There's a letter in there. If you take that out for me, I'm going to read this out, but your job is just to check over my shoulder that I'm not changing anything, all right? So I'll take it out. Thank you so much. All right. Are you there, Nick? So, look, as I read this out, please, when it gets to the important bit, don't react. So, uh, tonight on the 27th of March, that is tonight, at the Grand Theatre Leeds, that's where we are, I shall ask someone to think of a word. Oh, I did say a man aged between 28 and 35. You are, aren't you? Yes. yes? And in the earning group, 20 to 50k? Yes. And in long-term relationship? Yes. OK. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> the fact the weather has been cold and overcast today, so you start thinking more about inside sort of things, indoorsy things. The language I use when I ask them to think of a word, and I was using very visual language with the dictionary and so on. Uh, the fact that I've stood them up, which means they'll be thinking under pressure, and I got you to change your mind again and again and again, which sort of increases that pressure and starts to kind of uh, push them down certain avenues. All these and other subtle factors will combine to hopefully psychologically force the person to think of a particular word, which is film, right? Film as in, uh, you know, as in movies or... Um, Film, right? Camera film, film, movies and so on. Do you want to bring yourself up here? Come and stand here for me. Thank you, Nick. Do you want to keep reading this out? If you just go from, go from there, from the person, into the mic. Off you go, Luke. Thank you. The person who wrote the word has been told not to react. If they have written any word in the English language other than film, this does not reflect badly on Darren or his presented <laughs> skills. <laughs> Fair point. But if I, but if, excuse me, if out of all the words they could have chosen, they have written film, the audience will go mental. And it does say it there very clearly in print. Mental. <laughs> um, you've got this, you've got this look like this hasn't worked, and I think I know why. Um, whatever it is, if you take it out, hold it up, show the camera there, like for a good five seconds, everybody can read it. Whatever it is, just shout into the mic as well what it is. Sorry, I've sealed it. Oh, you've sealed it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. God, the suspense. No, no, no. Christ. The word is film. The word is film, you did! <laughs> there you go, keep all of that. You can have that if you like. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Luke. Thank you too, Luke. Luke and Nick! <laughs> Thank you so much. I would love. <clears throat> She's coming back through. Amanda, love, stand up, your grandma, she's come back. <laughs> All right, she's saying there's a number in your phone number like a five or a three or a nine. <laughs> yes. Which one? Three. Three, that's what she's saying now. She's showing me a three very clearly. The others have fading away. She's... <laughs> there's not a triple two in the middle, is there, love? Two, two, two? No. No, that's what she's saying. There's not a triple two in, in the middle. <laughs> It's another 40 pounds you can sit yourself back down. Thank you, I'm sorry. Listen, if you've ever been to see a spiritualist medium, or particularly if you think you may go and see a medium at some point, I would love for you to come up on stage in the second half of this show and allow me to do a form of mediumship with you. So if this appeals to you and you are 18 or over, can you bring yourself to those stairs in the interval? They'll bring you up when it's safe to come up. But first, I would love to give one of you a, a gift, but a real gift. The gift of a trance state. And this trance state will be such that for the brief amount of time that you are in it, it'll be the equivalent of spending a week at a really expensive, exclusive spa somewhere. So I'm only going to choose one of you to give you the full experience. But nonetheless, you can all take part in this and get a taste of it and feel what it's like, because it's so good for you and it feels amazing. So if you'd like to do it, please, stand up. Up you get. Up you get. Come on, feet flat on the floor. Stand yourselves up. 
If you stand with your hands down by your sides, and stand with your feet about a hips width apart, so you can stand quite solidly, quite comfortably, good. Anybody watching this at home, this will not work on you at home, all right? You can watch the show quite safely, it won't have any influence on you at home, so don't worry about that. I'm not quite gonna hypnotize you, it's a little bit different, because I want you to be aware of it. That's the whole point, is that you enjoy it. Okay, good. So take a look at me. Take a deep breath, right the way in, now. Bring it all the way in, right the way in. And then let it out. Again, deep breath all the way in. And out. And again, all the way in. And out. Now, tense up the muscles in your feet and your legs. And with your eyes closed now, listen very carefully. You're keeping your eyes closed. In a moment, I'm going to count to three and click my fingers. When I do, you will go straight down into this sleep state. You'll remain standing. Your head will drop down. Your breathing will become lovely and deep and rhythmical. And you can just sink straight down. Still hearing and understanding everything. Here we go. Just go with it. I want you to enjoy it. Here we go. One, two, three. Three, sleep, but as your head drops down, just let your whole body relax. And as you do this, I want you to imagine that you are walking down a staircase. And each step that you take on the staircase relaxes you more and takes you deeper. Each breath that you breathe relaxes you more and takes you deeper into this sleep, still hearing and understanding everything. And as you do this, I'm gonna come down and talk to a couple of you. And the nice thing is it'll take me a couple of minutes to find a couple of you to talk to, which gives you plenty of time to just continue to sink and drift deeper and deeper down at your own rate and speed. That's really good. That's really good. Let me come across to talk to a couple of you as you continue down the staircase, each step taking you deeper, each word that I say relaxing you more and taking you deeper into that sleep. Excuse me, can I bring you out of there? Good. So I'm just going to talk to a gentleman here. I'm putting my hand on your shoulder. You'll know that I'm talking to you as you carry on sleeping. I'm going to bring your arm out here. We're going to lock it into place. So clench your fist and lock that arm tightly into place. Now tighter and tighter, locking it tightly into place. That's good. So tight. Now that when I take my hand away, it just carries on locking all on its own. Tighter and tighter into place. You see, the more you try to unlock it, the more it just keeps on locking. Tighter and tighter. That's good. Until I touch you on the hand again. And when I do, it'll be released. And as it comes down, you'll just sink and tumble and fall so deeply down into that sleep now right the way down I got you right the way deep and right the way sound asleep just drifting and sinking down that's really good excellent very good thank you so in a moment I'm going to count backwards from three to zero and this will wake you up it'll bring you up and out of the sleep and very importantly I'm talking to you all as a group but I'm also talking to each of you as an individual I'm talking to the deepest part of your unconscious mind three here we go waking up has never felt so good two and one, and when you are quite ready to be fully wide awake for the rest of the evening, zero, you can open your eyes, come back to us, be fully wide awake, to take a look around you. Feels good, doesn't it? Enjoy that. Nice, isn't it? Yeah. Hi, hello, great. So, uh, take a seat, apart from you, what's your name? Adam. Adam, lovely to meet you, Adam. Give Adam a big hand, could you take this off? Just put that on your chair in front of you. Uh, give Adam a hand as you bring him up. Happy come, Adam. Lovely, happy time, Adam. Thank you. The rest of you can take a seat for me. Thank you, Adam. All of you, please, as I'm bringing up Adam, can you all please take a look? All of you at both of your neighbours. Very quickly, people on both sides of you. Everybody do that for me now. Even if you don't know them, just a quick look. Thank you, Adam. I'm going to stand you there facing the front. Thank you so much. A quick look to people on both sides. If either of your neighbours is still asleep, <laughs> now's a really good time to let me know. Put your hand up and make a fuss, otherwise I will presume everybody is wide awake. Good. So is it Adam? Adam, nice to meet you. Thank you. Look at me now and just sleep. Right the way back down. Right the way deep. I got you. Right the way sound asleep. Just drifting and sinking and floating and spiraling. That's good. My voice just there in the center of your head. One thing that really interests me about this fact that we are trapped inside our own heads, that we're the center of our own world, is that we tend to think that problems in life are real and solid and permanent. The reality is those same things, just viewed from a different perspective, can suddenly seem temporary and flimsy somehow. And Adam, you're really good at this. And every time I put you back into this sleep, you are gonna go deeper, it'll be richer, it'll be more enjoyable each time that you do this. But for now, I want you just to slowly reorientate yourself back to the room. You'll feel yourself waking up, you feel that refreshment moving up through you. When you're quite ready, you can open your eyes and come back to us. Excellent. 
Thank you, Adam. All right, so let me show you this here. This is something you can all do with each other. You need to get yourself a box that you can put your hand through. I can just do it a little more quickly with Adam because I know he'll be very responsive to this. Adam, I'm going to put something in this box. I don't want you seeing what it is. So if you don't mind, just face the front and just, just close your eyes just so you can't see. It's nothing, uh, it's nothing unpleasant. It's a very ordinary household object. I just don't want you seeing what it is. Okay. Okay, Adam, you can open your eyes now for me. Thank you. Can you put your hand flat on top of the box? Maybe take a sideways step towards it as well. Please don't look at what's in there. Thank you. All right. So in a minute, I'm going to get you to lower your hand into the box and find the object. You will probably tell what it is pretty quickly, but it's not really about you identifying it. This is just about you paying attention to kind of the sensations that you get and how you interpret them, okay? So lower your hand in for me. Find the object. First question, how would you describe the temperature of that object? Room temperature. Room temperature, yeah. good. And if, if you squeeze it, would you say it was sort of soft or hard or squidgy or...? Slightly plain. Slightly oh, plain, okay. Hard, yeah. Very good. Now you're lifting it up, is it light or heavy? It's light. Can you tell what it is? Apple. It is indeed an apple, great. So leave the apple where it is, bring your hand up for me, Adam, that's great, thank you. Hand by your side again, would you close your eyes again for me, please? Just face the front, thank you. Good, you're doing great. This time, I'm going to cover the front of the box so none of you see what it is. So you keep your eyes close to me as well. Good. Uh, give me just a moment, you're doing great, Adam. OK, you can open your eyes for me. Hand on top of the box again. This time, um, we'll do it a little bit differently, and I would invite you to join in with this, if you like. I want you to think of something in your life, Adam, I won't ask you what it is, something that makes you feel, something that feels like it's big and getting on top of you at the moment. Feels like it's weighing you down. You think of something? Good. All right, now, whatever you're thinking of, if you run it through in your mind like a sort of a movie, as you sort of think it through to get those feelings, you'll notice you make that movie screen up here. You make it big and on top of you, which is why it feels like that, all right? Now, if you shrink that down, to the size of an iPad, and then bring that down here instead, and take a look at it there instead, Adam. Now watch the same thing, but on that little screen instead. No longer feels like it's getting on top of you, because now you're on top of it. Same thing, but a very different perspective. In fact, as you watch it there now, you can start to feel a real feeling of stability and confidence moving through you. A very different feeling as you watch it. And that can expand up into your chest and shoulders, that's good, it can feel really good. As you start to feel like a giant, towering above this thing that used to feel like a problem, as you feel like a colossus towering above this stage. Good, solid and confident, that's good. Lower your hand into the box now and look at me, look at me. Fingertips, all right, just with your fingertips, find the object, just very gently. Try and keep looking at me as you do this. Find it in the middle there. First question as you move your fingers along it is, what would you say it's made of? And a guess. Metal. Metal, good. Now just get a sense of the shape of it, move your fingertips along it, perhaps you can tell what it is. What would you, what do you think? A spoon. A spoon, what sort of spoon, Adam? Tablespoon, silver spoon. Like a big one or a little one? Little one. Little like a teaspoon? Yeah, teaspoon, yeah. Teaspoon? Yeah. Great, okay, you leave that teaspoon where it is. Then look at me, just bring your hand out, leave the teaspoon where it is, bring your hand out of the box. Good, excellent, lovely. Face the front, close your eyes again for me, just close your eyes. I'll show you all the teaspoon that he was feeling. Um, I just don't want you seeing, so do keep your eyes closed. As he was feeling confident, feeling like a giant, this was the teaspoon that he felt. All right, you're doing great, just keep your eyes closed, me Adam, but you are doing Brilliantly. I'm going to cover the front of the box again so you can't see. I'll put one more thing in there. Uh, this is a slightly trickier object to get in, so give me just a moment with this one. Yeah, one. Okay, keep your eyes closed. It's a little longer, Adam. Open your eyes for me. Hand on top of the box. This time, you're going to think of something that makes you feel warm and safe and cosy. Anything you like in life. It could be a person or a place or a memory or something that makes you feel nice and warm and safe and cosy. You got something? OK. Whatever you're picturing there, just bring that image a little closer. Make the colours softer and fuzzier. That's lovely. Just keep that feeling there. And look at me again. Lower your hand into the box. Very gently this time. Absolute fingertips, all right? Absolute fingertips. Find the object and then really gently, maybe let your hand move underneath it a little. Let it move onto your hand a little, get a sense of, would you say it's light or heavy? What would you say now? Light. Again? Light. Light, very good. Now, more complicated shape this time, Adam, so take your time with it. You might be able to get a sense of what it is if you take your time and feel the shape of it and the contours. What do you think it is? Glove. A glove? Yeah. What sort of glove? Like a woolly glove or a leather glove or a 
A woolly glove. A little louder, please. A woolly glove. A woolly glove. Great. You leave that woolly glove where it is, then, please. Bring your hand out for me. Bring your hand out. Very gently, let it. Good. Lovely. Hands by sides. Close your eyes again for me. Thank you. And I'll show you all the woolly glove that he was feeling. I just don't want you seeing again. So, perhaps we can get that. Thank you. Could you take that for me? Lovely. Great. Thank you. Open your eyes. Face the front for me. Good. Clearly an odd reaction for you, I realise. Thank you. Uh, clearly they were seeing something there that, that, that you weren't seeing. I realise that. Um, but I'm sure your friends will explain to you what happened when you join them again. Come forward for me. Um, so, uh, point is, you're very good at this, Adam, right? And I'd like to give you this trance state as a, uh, as a gift. But this is going to happen in the interval. Is that all right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Who are you with here tonight? Uh, my mum and my sister. Your mum and your sister, OK. Yeah. Um, what's, what's your mum's name? Christine. Christine, all right, I might talk, talk to her in a moment. Have you got a mobile phone on you at the moment? I do. OK, can I, I'm going to take that for a moment. Yeah. I will give it to your mum in just a second as well. Thank you. All right, could you sit yourself up here for me? You happy to do this in the interval, yeah? Yeah. Great, lovely, OK. <laughs> we'll look after your mum and sister. We'll get them a drink as well. We'll make sure they're taken care of. Just swing your legs around for me. And then, yeah, and then lay back as well. So we'll check, we'll check the pillows in the right place and you're comfortable and uh, just get yourself comfy. All right, and put your legs out and... Good, now sit yourself straight back up. Okay. Happy get, lovely. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> so, Adam... <laughs> this trance state now we're going to do, it only exists for your benefit. It's the only reason for doing this. Uh, this is a completely private and personal thing for you now. Bring your finger up for me like this. Yeah. Just point your finger, good. So, in a moment, I'm going to touch my finger to yours. When I do, your eyes will close. You'll go back into this trance state and your trance journey will begin. Are you ready? Good. I'll see you on the other side. Excellent, Adam. That's really good. Thank you. And Adam, you can now just sleep. And as you sleep, you can drift and sink back down that staircase. As you sink deeper, everything else happens a hundred miles away. And just to make sure that your experience is really kept quite separate and private and detached, we're placing a sort of cocoon around you, just to make sure that your experience is kept quite separate as you sink deeper and deeper down into that trance state. And everything else happens a hundred miles away as you continue down that staircase. That's really good. So I can talk to all of you, and Adam can hear me. It just doesn't distract him as he sinks deeper down into his trance state. Uh, his mum, Christine, could you stand up for me? Where are you? Over there somewhere, I guess. Hi, Christine. So I'm going to ask you to draw a picture. Um, there's a couple of things that are important, so please, I, I want you to understand this. First of all, it needs to be a drawing of something that is a real-world physical object, something you could actually touch, as opposed to just like a geometric shape or a design or something like that. Does that make sense? OK, and if there's anything else that you just think that Adam might think that you personally would draw for some reason, then ignore that as well, all right? Can you think of something suitable now? Yeah, perfect, all right. Whatever you draw, there's a guy with a pen and paper at the side there. When you've drawn it, Christine, can you write underneath what it is? Then you won't worry about how accurately you've drawn it as well. So write what it is, but don't let anybody see, including the guy with the pen and paper and none of the cameramen or anything like that either. When you've done it, remember, write underneath what it is and then seal it in an envelope. You should have an envelope there as well. Thank you, Christine, if you can go and do that for me now. Thank you. So. Um, while Christine's doing that, let me explain what's going to happen next. We're going to take an interval. If, during this interval, you would like to come up on stage in the second half, if you have a genuine interest in the possibility of mediumship, please bring yourself to the bottom of the steps on that side there. They will bring you up in the interval when it's safe to come up. When you do come up, take a look at Adam. He's sleeping quite soundly. And then come and sit yourself down. Uh, did that give you enough time to draw your picture, Christine? Yeah. Great. Could you bring yourself up here for me? Thank you. Great. So, first of all, I'm just going to give you Adam's phone. I just took off him up there, so you've got that. Thank you. And can you write your name for me? Um, in big letters, you can lean on this if you like, but just um, right where you've sealed it, right across that join, so you know it can't now be tampered with, right across the join. Thank you, Christine. Lovely. Thank you. I'll put that there. Thank you. And you take his phone. Thank you. So, come over here for me. Come and take a look at your son. He's sleeping quite soundly. There's a couple of things I need to ask you to do, and they're both really important, all right? First thing is, you have to keep that a secret. Now, no one saw what you drew, did they? No, great. So please keep it a secret. Don't even tell your daughter that you're with here as well. Absolute secret. The other thing is, every two or three minutes throughout the interval, can you please remember, in your head, just say to yourself, Adam, I drew a... And then whatever it is, as if you were kind of whispering in his ear what it was. But that isn't out loud, that is just silently in your head. But you must do it. You promise to do that, even though that sounds a bit odd. All right, lovely. Thank you. Well, there'll be an usher to take a drink order for you both, and we'll make sure you're taken care of. But thank you so much. And I'll speak to you in the second half. Thank you, Christine. So I'm hoping 
that while Adam sleeps, that he'll be able to intuit at some level what his mother has drawn and sealed into that envelope. It's really good, Adam. You can just continue to sink and drift down even more deeply into the sleep as you find yourself now in a beautiful garden. And as you lay on the grass, and as you feel the warmth of the grass beneath you, and then the fresh air as the breeze blows through the garden, keeping the temperature to the perfect level. And as you do this, I'm going to bring your hands up onto your chest, which will actually help you sleep even more deeply. So I'm going to bring them up here as you continue to sleep. Good. Thank you. Excellent. You just need to get to your stomach, because I'm just going to roll your T-shirt up a little as you sleep. I'm just going to bring this up here and tuck it in. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So I thought in this half of the show I would talk to you about some of my obsessions. <laughs> Ten years ago, my father called me up to tell me he'd been diagnosed with cancer. And it turned out to be an early form of cancer. It was quite treatable, and ten years later, he's, he's fine. But at the time, I was quite shaken up by it. And I spoke to a few friends about it. One girl that I spoke to that I knew said, um, you should take him to see the homeopath that my mum saw when she had cancer. He completely cured it. And I thought, a couple of things. First of all, I thought, yeah, your mum also had six months of chemotherapy, which you've just edited out of that story, but okay. And secondly, I know about things like homeopathy because they do interest me. There have been dozens of systematic reviews of all of the hundreds of tests that have been done on homeopathy over the years, proper tests. And we do know now for a fact that it doesn't work. We know that the results are actually very clear, quite unambiguous. It doesn't work, it doesn't have any real effect. And, uh, and I tried to nicely explain this to her, and she said, well, it is your dad, though. You could afford to be a bit more open-minded. Open-minded. Uh, thank you. Stand you just there. Thank you. Stay still, hold your hands out. In the Philippines, if you have cancer, there's a form of treatment available to you where the surgeon, without using any instruments or any knives, uses psychic vibrations to enter the body of the patient. So you will feel, Adam, a little bit of poking here for a moment, and then all of this just happens 100 miles away. That's good. and removes from inside any cancerous tumours or demonised parts. You OK? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Would you uh, sit yourself back down again, thank you. Of course, it's a conjuring trick. It's a really ugly scam called psychic surgery. And sometimes, rather like with homeopathy, sometimes people do get better, surprisingly, either because they were just going to get better anyway, or because of the placebo effect, which just means that for some people with low-level conditions, their belief that this is actually going to help is enough to create a genuine improvement, which is great for those people, but clearly not the same as saying that this is uh, an effective treatment or something that you'd want to use instead of medicine that does actually stand up to testing, let alone anything, sadly, that's ever going to help cancer. But hey, got to be open-minded. Being open-minded, it doesn't mean just believing everything. 
because you'd like it to be true. Being truly open-minded is about being prepared to change your beliefs based on the evidence or the lack of evidence. Otherwise, you can be so open-minded that your brain falls out. Hold that thought. I'm going to come back to it. Thank you, Adam. That's really great. I'm going to bring this back down now. And Adam, you can now take all the time that you need to completely and slowly wake up out of the trance. You will feel this refreshment move right the way through you, right the way to the top of your head. And when you're quite ready, you'll find that your eyes will open all on their own and you'll be fully back with us. Take all the time that you need. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Just want to sit yourself up. Take your time. Just slowly sit yourself up. Don't worry about any blood on the sheets, that's fine. Just up you go. <laughs> swing yourselves around, just swing your legs around that way. Just, just pop yourself there for a moment. Um, let me get you some water. You've got a bit of a dry mouth. Give me a microphone as well. Uh, there you go. I haven't touched that one. There you go. Have that. Well, can I just get this in there? Can I just move your leg there for a bit? Um, so look, you were great. How, what's it like coming out of it? It feels pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> bit sort of spaced out, but it feels good, yeah? There's a bunch of people up here behind you, by the way. This is the... Second half of the show now. <laughs> um, so great, listen, oh, one thing. Um, do you remember this box? We could bring this box out again from Adam. You remember how you, you had your hand in this yeah. box before? Um, so look, if you look through the front, you, it's important you look, you'll see there's nothing in there. And you can all see from the back, there's nothing in the box, right? So put your hand flat on top for me, Adam. So look, there's nothing in there, right? But in a moment, you're going to lower your hand in. And as you do, I'm going to count from one to five and you will feel something inside the box. Something will come from the back of your mind, down to your fingertips. You'll be able to feel it in the box. You'll be able to describe it to me. And you'll do a really good job of describing that to me. So here we go. Lower your hand in now as I count. Look at me. One, two, three. There you go. Four. That's good. Five. So your first question, Adam, is this thing that you're feeling, does it feel like something living or something man-made? Man-made. Man-made. Okay, good. All right, so take your time with it now. I just want you to carry on just describing... Just describe to me what sort of surface does it... Can you tell what it's made of? Is it, like, solid? Is it plastic? Is it furry? Is it... What kind of surface are you getting? Like, plastic. Like plastic, okay. Yeah. Can you describe a sh maybe its shape to me, or what your sort of... Uh, what's it like? Cylinder. Okay, great. Yeah. But not really cylinder. Go on. It's sort of cylindrical, sort of, yeah? Yeah. Go on, so keep going, keep talking me through it. What, are you, feeling? what are you feeling at the moment? Spikes on the back. Or something like that. So it's like cylindrical, but with spikes. Got... Can you, can you recognise it as being anything? It feels a bit like a, um, a plane. Oh, like, a, like an aeroplane? Yeah. Okay. Well, like, yeah, just like a yeah, toy plane when you were a kid or something. Okay. Well, just, can you find the wings? Are there wings on it? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. You're feeling them now? Yeah, pointy things, yeah. <laughs> and so the spike, I guess, was like the tail fin yeah. of the, of the, of the yeah. plane. So does it point at the other end? Is there like a nose to yeah. it as well? Yeah. Can you feel windows? I mean, are you feeling like... No. You're not getting windows, okay, no. but you're getting the shape of a plane. So, what's, so you've got the nose at the other end. Yeah. Do have a look at it as you're doing this, because it's really interesting. If you look at it, you'll see there's nothing, you know, you know there's nothing there, I'm sure, but you can see. What's that like? It's just weird, man. <laughs> <laughs> and you can all see from the back, there is nothing, you can see there's nothing in there. So is there anything else, or is it just an aeroplane? No, I can just feel an aeroplane. Okay, all right, well, why don't you leave the aeroplane where it is? Bring your hand out for us. That's great, Adam. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> so look, while you were asleep, your mum drew a picture and has been sending this to you, sort of mentally, telepathically, through the interval. Um, before we get too excited, it probably won't, won't be an aeroplane, but there should be a good connection between the two. So it might be something to do with travel, it might be something like a, like a car, you know, or a lorry or a bus or something like that. We'll have a look and see what it is. Um, but I chose your mum rather than your sister here as well, because you'll have the longest connection with your mum. So uh, we'll see. Do you want to... Um... Oh, Christian, you didn't tell anybody what this was, did you? No. No? Great, OK. I'll let you have a look first, but I'm quite intrigued to see what this is. Maybe you can show the camera as well. Ooh, 
Wow. That is absolutely spot on. <laughs> well done. Let me just show the camera again. That is an aeroplane. I'll show you back there as well. That is, uh, that is a, definitely an aeroplane. Thank you, Adam and Christine. Thank you both. It's really good. My day you go. Thank you so much. When we are at our most vulnerable, we do tend to stop thinking as rationally, and we tend to grasp at whatever feels like it'll give us comfort, which is fair enough, but it can be exploited. And there was a really important point first put forward in the 18th century by a philosopher called David Hume, who said, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. And all that means is, if you are claiming something that's extraordinary, so something that flies in the face of science, like talking to the dead, for example, and you wish to be taken seriously, firstly, you have to come up with the evidence yourself to back up your own claim. It's not enough just to insist that other people have to try and disprove it, which you could never do. You can never prove that something isn't true. That's trying to prove a negative, so it wouldn't work anyway. So you've got to come up with the evidence yourself to back up your claim, and it's got to be really strong evidence because your claim is so strong. So if, for example, a magician saws a woman in half every night on stage during his show and then starts saying, that isn't a trick, I do it for real. I really do it. I take a woman, any woman, I can do it with any woman. I saw her in half, I use any saw. I pull her into two and then I put it back together and I heal her up and I'm doing it for real. It isn't a trick and he expects you to believe him. You would say, well, come on, you've got to come up with some pretty strong evidence that you're doing that for real. If you said that and then he said, you want evidence? Come see my show. I do it every night. That doesn't count. That's not evidence. That's the very thing you're questioning, right? So you would say, well, no, that's all on your terms. Come do the same thing under controlled conditions and then I'll absolutely believe you. That just means, you know, conditions that are fair for everybody. So if you say you can do it with any woman, we'll provide a woman. Great. If you say you can use any saw, let us provide the saw and so on. And if you set all that up, I make it absolutely fair for everybody. And then he says, well, I'm not going to do it now because you're sceptical and the energy's all wrong. You can say, well, stop wasting our time, you big baby. So with that in mind, you're all up here because you have a genuine interest in the possibility of mediumship. I would love to show you how it is possible for me or somebody with a similar skill base to seemingly know things about people that you've known who have passed on without and I promise you, any psychic ability, let alone any contact with the dead. Are you happy for me to do this, first of all? Yes? It won't be with all of you, it'll be with a tiny handful of you, but I hope nonetheless that you all take something from this, all right? And we don't know each other, do we? No. We do not know each other. For that reason, you've written down your first names on cards, which have been collected here in this bowl, so thank you so much for doing that. I'll be plucking your names out as we go along, so I don't know who I'm gonna get, thank you. Um, and also, as we do this, I'm gonna write things down on bits of paper, on cards, rather, um, which will get projected up onto the wall behind you. Please don't look at what I've written. I'll show you, but only after you've given your answers. And just have a quick check, it's always worth doing this nowadays, that I'm not wearing any sort of earpiece. Can you see in my ear there? Mm -hmm. Nothing there? Happy with that one, too? All right, it's important you know I'm not being fed any information. Not that it would help me anyway, all right, as you'll see. Okay, with that in mind, let's begin. There is, <clears throat> there is a lady stood on the stairs at the moment. About halfway up, she's got her hand on the railing. She's wearing like a pinky blue um, jumper with a V-neck, probably in her 50s, maybe. I'm going to ask her to come down. She says she's coming through. She's coming through for a lady uh, with a name. Uh, re, uh, begins with an R. Rian, Rian, or Rebecca? Is there a Rebecca, or is it? Are you Rebecca? Could you stand up for me? Maybe, maybe, maybe she's coming through for you. Let me just. Um, uh, if you can stay right there, that's fine. You can stay where you are. Let me just give you that. Could you take that back? Oh, thank you. All right. So, um, so this is a lady in her fifties. 
Is there anybody that you, first of all, don't say who it is, is there somebody you can think that this maybe could be a lady in her 50s that you would have met her? It would be somebody that you would know. Yeah. Someone come to mind? Okay. Um, well, she give me a name. Hang on, let me just try and get this. Uh, uh, I'm guessing she might have been perhaps, I don't know, maybe grandmother or something like that, or, yeah. What was... Do you know, what, what was your grandma's name? Lillian. Again? Lillian. Lillian. Okay, well, I've sort of got Lucy and Lily, so I mean, this, I, think this, I think this is probably her. So I think, so Lillian is, she's nodding ahead, she's nodding ahead. So Lillian is coming through now for you, uh, Rebecca, so that she can give you, she can say things to you through me that I couldn't know as proof that she's coming through, all right? It isn't proof, Rebecca. It isn't even the flimsiest form of evidence. It simply doesn't count because these are not controlled conditions for such a claim. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But nonetheless, she's saying... Yes. Okay. She's asking if you, if you, got, the, um, if you got the letter. She's saying... She's asking, did you get the letter, is what she's saying. Yeah. Obviously, this means something to you. Um, I wasn't sure what that was. What, what is it? What, what letter is she talking about? Um, before she died, she wrote me a letter. Because I was only one. You were only one? Oh, you were little. And she wrote, so she wrote it for you to read? Yeah. So you did get it and you did read it? When I was 18, she gave it to my mum and said, don't let her read it until she's 18. And that's what she's asking about. So she's asking about this letter as partly to ask and partly as evidence that she's, that she's coming through for you, which she isn't, and you understand that. So, look, she's just taking a step back now. I think this is all we're going to hear from her. Sometimes it is so brief. So I think you can probably take a seat for me now, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just take a name um, out of here. Uh, there's, a, there's a David on top. David? David, stand up for me. Thank you. If there's any other Davids, feel free to stand as well. Again, if you can pass the microphone back. And forgive me, David, if nobody comes through for you. Again, same thing, all right? Um, if no... No, the, the lady is for you. Sorry. Um, okay, this is an older lady as well, possibly. Again, yeah, maybe grandmother, perhaps. Oh, I have a name. She says, uh, you, you haven't known this woman, she's saying, for quite a long time. She can remember how old you were when you last saw her. Um, if you went to a... If you did go to a medium, is there anybody you would hope would come through for you? My grandma. Your grandma. Do you know how old you were when you last saw her? About 12. About 12. What was her name? Evelyn. Evelyn. We have her here, right? She's right here. Uh, if I think back to my grandmother, I can remember like things that happened to her. Is there something you can remember or something you were told about your grandmother, something I could ask, something that wouldn't happen to everyone's grandmother or something not everyone's grandmother would have done? Yeah. OK. If you can think of that for me, I'm going to ask her to tell me something. But what I find happens in these situations is that she will tell me exactly the same thing that you're thinking of because of the connection between you two at the moment, right? So let me ask her just something that happened when, she, when you would have known her. OK, she's, she's telling me, um, and she isn't telling me anything, you understand this, I'm making this up, I'm lying to you. <laughs> she's telling me, uh, I'm going to write this down here. <laughs> OK, slow down, slow down a second, one second. Hang on, one second, I'm just going <laughs> to... Hang on a minute, and don't look behind you, because it's up on the wall, but don't look, right? I'm just going to ask her a bit more, for a bit more information about this. Got it, OK. All right. Where did your mind go? When I said for you to think of something that happened, what, what, what did you think of? Um, a story my mum told me about my mum and my grandma when they went on a holiday. Where did they go? They went to Gibraltar. Well, they went to Gibraltar. What well, happened? I think they went to Spain, but they went to Gibraltar for a day trip. What happened? She got bit by a monkey on Gibraltar. <laughs> <laughs> this is precisely what she's told me. Again, I got bitten by a monkey at uh, the Gibraltar Rock. She's heading back. I'll tell you what, I've got, probably just got time for one more. Uh, oh, no, I won't. No, somebody is pushing their way forward. OK, there's... Um, uh, OK, I have a lady... There's probably quite a forthright character in life, I would think. There's a lady in her 70s, I would think, early 70s, asking for... I'm sorry? For jo uh, Georgia? Georgina? Is there a Georgia or a Georgina? Could you stand up for me? Thank you. Um, so this is a lady in her 70s. Um, I was going to just get a 
My, have you got the microphone? Can we pass the microphone across? Uh, so this is a lady uh, in her 70s. Again, have a little think. I've got a name. She's given me some information about herself. Uh, she says, uh, could this be um, a grandmother as well? You're thinking? Yeah. Uh, she's got, how old, you may not know. Do you know how old your grandma was when she died? I think she was 72. And her name? Doris. Doris, okay. Again, yeah. we have her here, which we don't, all right? Is there something um, she's saying? I've got a few people coming up on both sides now, which is making this a little bit tricky, but I just want to focus on Doris here for a moment. Um, she's saying she, uh, she's got sort of brown hair, which is probably maybe unusual for a lady in her 70s, is that right? Yeah. She, um, she didn't, she's not, not grey, no. unusually, not grey hair. I can see her, she's very clearly here, which she isn't, again. I've got um, people coming up on both sides. Uh, she's saying she had a dog, that you'd remember her dog. Yes. Is that right? You'd remember her dog, you liked her dog. People coming up on both sides. I've got a lot of people, I think anybody now that any of you were hoping to contact, I now have coming up on stage, on both sides, as well as the deceased friends and relatives of 2,000 people behind me. <laughs> I also have making their way up, both sides uh, up here onto the stage. They're all talking at the same time, but I want to get this right, because they're all saying the same thing. So let me just, I just want to get this right. It's obviously important, because they're all saying the same thing. Okay, thank you. All right, I've got it. They are saying, if they ever get the chance to communicate with the living, they promise you they will not do it through some needy showbiz performer. They promise you that. No one has the right to trample on your memories of people that you've loved. It's, it's just disgusting. Did you know her dog's name? Zelda. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you so much for letting me do this. I really, really do appreciate it. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna ask, uh, let's go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Eight, nine. Can you nine just stand yourselves down here? And can the rest of you head back? Thank you so very much for letting me do that. Please give them a hand as they go back. Thank you so much. Uh, what's your name? Emma. Nice to meet you. Emma, and you are? Johnny. Johnny. Emma and Johnny, let's go. Johnny, can you stand behind that, uh, behind that table there for me? Thank you so much. Can the rest of you just gather around me here? I just need you to check something, and it's so important. I've, I know I've said this once, but I want you to check again that I'm not wearing any kind of earpiece. Stick your fingers in, have a proper look. Go on, stick your fingers have a proper look. Go on, oh, you're actually doing, you're actually doing that. People don't normally bother. <laughs> yeah. Go on, stick your fingers in, have a proper look. It's so important you know now that what's happening, that I'm doing for real, right? That I'm not being fed any information. Two years ago, I started a memorization project in anticipation of the finale of this show. I memorized two iconic works of British fiction. The first one I learned was this. The complete works of Shakespeare. I learned these, I have memorized these, this particular edition as well. Uh, pretty much word for word. So that's the first thing, complete works of Shakespeare. Any Americans in the audience, uh, very famous novelist. <laughs> Next iconic work of British fiction are our bus timetables. Uh, I've learned number one to number 799, so nearly 800 bus routes. And just the routes, just the stops, not the times as well, otherwise that'd be mental. Um, was it Johnny as well? Was yeah, it? Johnny. Johnny, thank you. So Johnny, there's a horn here which will be sounding in a minute, pressing the button at the top. A bowl of rice and some talcum powder. So knock yourself out, I'll explain those in a minute. Um, can you gather yourselves around here, so you've each got a bowl in front of you. Just four down this side, four down that side, lovely. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, just bring yourselves around, four on each side. Thank you so much. Uh, the bowls all have dice in. You have one die each. So if you give them a few rolls, just so you're happy, they're all regular dice and so on, which they are. While you're doing that, in the audience, if you have calculators, can you please turn them on for me? Turn on your calculators. Uh, if you have an iPhone, please turn it landscape. This is really important. It'll open up the scientific mode. It means you can deal with longer strings of numbers, which you will need. Thank you, good. Next, a couple of Rubik's Cubes. I'm gonna hand them out on this side. Uh, if you get them, we'll maybe start towards the back. If you just mix them up and just pass them forward. Thank you so much. Would you mind taking them? Thank you. Just make sure people pass them forward when you're from the back. Lovely. And if you end up with them here at the front, can you stick them just sort of here on the, on the top for me? Thank you. So I can grab them. Good. OK, while that's going on on this side, on this side, I'd like somebody to write down a 10-digit number. If somebody can write down a 10-digit number for me, please. Thank you. So Usher, please, pen and paper. That'd be lovely. So while they're writing down a 10-digit number, we are going to use these dice to generate an 8-digit number. Uh, so basically, we'll roll them in a minute again, and I'll take a line down this side and then back up this side. So at the moment, it would go three, two, two, five, one, two, five, two would be our eight-digit number. So pick them up for me. We're going to roll them again. Uh, this time when we roll them, though, I'm going to write whatever we get on this board up here, and you have to write this number. You have to put this number into your calculators. So get ready to type in this next eight-digit number, all right? 
So go on, give them one more roll, take whatever we get this time. Uh, so the first one is four, yes? So four, the next one? Six. Six, next? Three. Three. Two. Two. Six. Six, make sure you're typing these in. Four. Four. Two. Two. Is it two two at the end? You're both two. Yeah, lovely. Two two. All right. So make sure you got that. Four six three two six four two two. Make sure you have that typed in. Brilliant. You have generated a random eight-digit number. You've done it perfectly. You may now head back and watch the rest of the show from your seats. But thank you so much. Please give them a hand. That way, if you don't mind, our random number generators. Okay. Here we go. When I was uh, at secondary school, I was a member of the music school gang also known as the Puff Gang, less charitably, by the rest of the school. And um, around this sort of age, so kind of like sort of 15, 16, that kind of age, um, I, I thought that I was, slash, really, this is sort of 15, 16. Oh, is that the Rubik's Cube's back? It is, thank you so much. Um, hang on, Rubik's Cube's are back. Thank you. Uh, all right, good. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, good, lovely. So, around that age, 15, 16, I thought that I was, slash really wanted to be, um, Ren McCormack. Any of you know Ren McCormack? Ren McCormack was the Kevin Bacon character in the film Footloose. It was very popular at the time. It's kind of how I saw myself at that age. This kind of infamous outsider figure, earning the respect of his peers through the gift of dance. <laughs> and here I am at the age of 15, rocking the sateen trousers. Hope you enjoy them. And I did have a nickname at school as well. It wasn't, it wasn't Wren or Footloose or anything. It was, quite simply, Dig Brain. Uh, <laughs> was my nickname as well. Thank you for laughing and yeah, bring it all back. And I was called Dig Brain because I could do things like a Rubik's Cube behind my back and mental maths tricks and human calculator stuff and that sort of thing. So I thought I would show you how I earned the title Dick Brain at school. So, Johnny, can you pick up the horn for me? In a minute, you are going to sound that horn. It's the button on the top. When you do, um, a countdown will start. So I normally do this in 10 minutes, but I'm going to try tonight to do it in nine and a half, uh, just to kind of beat my own record. The last minute will come up as a countdown on the back wall. When that countdown reaches zero, that is the end of the show. All right, there's no encore. There's no, you know, it just finishes. Well, that's the final moment of the show, and that gets to zero. And I think we have everything in place. The Rubik's Cubes are back. Thank you for doing that. We have a number generated by the dice. Uh, hopefully now someone's got a 10-digit number they're hanging on to. And Johnny has the horn. Good. OK. Uh, when I give you the signal in a minute, nice and loud and clear. Actually, sorry, one. If... Or a lot of... A lot of you will still be at school, or um, college, university even, if you are a bit of a dick brain, or you're just made to feel like one every day when you go in. Can I just promise you that all of those really cool kids, the, the sporty, cool guys and the skinny, pretty girls, all grew up to have the most boring adult lives and jobs, because they never had to forge their own path when they were younger. They never had to find their own way when they were little. And if you are having to do that now, it is tough. But I promise you, you grew up to have the most brilliant and creative adult life. Yeah, who ever heard of a, of a musician or an artist who just fitted in really easily at school? Nobody. So, so dick brains unite, yes? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Johnny, sound the horn on the count of three. I was going to... Sorry, put it down. That's fine, thank you. Put it down. Okay, first dick brain trick. Don't look at them, but it's the numbers behind me on the board. The eight-digit number. Don't look at them. Look at me for a minute. Can you remember the eight-digit number generated by the dice without looking at them? Okay, you can look at them now. The number is 4632-6422. Backwards, 2246-2364. Most of it would have all is to alternate, so give me a big shout if this is right. Uh, first, last, second in second, in third in third, and I'll end up in the middle. I'll end up in the middle. It goes... Four, two, six, two, three, four, two, six. Yes? Yes, thank you so much. Jesus. Thank you. Next. Next dick brain trick is the memorized bus route. So look, these first three digits of our eight-digit number will give us the bus route, all right? Four, six, three. Do you want to look it up? It's in the blue book. Four, six, three. Uh, now, you do not have a four, six, three round here, or at least not one that I know. 463 I'm doing here is near London. Can you stand in front of the mic for me with it, please? Um, so if I get this right, just shout out nice, clear yes into the mic. The first stop of 463 bus route is...
Causden South Station, correct? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I, I have done this. So here's how you can do it. And by the way, you can feign enthusiasm if you like, Johnny. I've learned 800 of these. <laughs> here's how you can do it. You link pictures together. You turn everything into a picture that you can visualise and you link it to the next thing. So you have to turn the number into a picture as well. So that's a little bit more tricky. You do it by turning each digit into a letter. And then you make a word out of the letters. So four, I use an R, because there's an R at the end of four, right? I use an R. Uh, six, I use a, a, a P, because it looks a bit like a, a P sort of on its side, like a P. And uh, three, I use an M, because it looks like a three on its side, right? So you've got RPM. You make a, a picture from that, either by adding vowel sounds to make a word, or I just use a record player, because it's RPMs, right? So my image that gives me the first bus stop is a record player, but it's, as it's going round, it's, it's making a fan move. It's, uh, it's sort of operating a fan fan that is cooling, it's cooling um, uh, uh, like a little den, like a work den in a station, right? This is a weird image, but it gives me cools den station, right? It gives me cools and station, which is, the first, uh, which is the first stop. Now, to continue, I just continue with this story in my head. I link to the next image. Nicholas Lindhurst from Only Fools and Horses, the actor, walks out of the station and down the road. Next stop is Lindhurst Road, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he walks out to a big clock tower, which is being mounted by some animals. That's it, isn't it? It's, it's, it's Clock Tower Farm, but it's a place called The Mount in Clock Tower Farm. No. Pardon? No. Clock Tower Farm, The Mount. It's close. <laughs> Clock Tower Farm, The Mount. That is what it is. What does it say? Clock House Farm. Clock House Farm, the mound. All right, sorry, OK. All right, then he goes up to it and he paints it green. Uh, Woodcoat wood coat green is the next stop. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to rattle through these now. Shout yes for each one that's right, OK? It goes um, Wallington Station, Forecourt. Yeah. Wallington Green. Yeah. Beddington uh, uh, Church. Yeah. Beddington Asda. Yeah. Beddington Lane, Jessop's Way. Yeah. Mitchfield, Mitch, um, Mitcham East Station. Yeah. The Wide Way. Yeah. Finishing at Pollard's Hill at 6.28 in the morning? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. I've done this right. Good. Thank you. All right, next one. Next is how you apply this. So, here's how you apply it. Pick up the book for me. This is The Complete Works of Shakespeare, turned to page 264. They should teach this stuff in schools because it's exactly what you need when it comes to regurgitating information, which is what we need for exams, sadly, nowadays, right? I knew this stuff when I was little, and I don't mean to show off, but I got one of the top marks in the year in the country for English A-level precisely by using this technique. Have you got it, page 264? Yeah. All right, so first word on that page. Have a look at it for me. The first word on page 264 is... First word is the word hearts. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if I can see it, it goes hearts, comma, and hymen did our hands, new line, unite, co-mutual with most sacred bands. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I have, I have done this for real. Uh, okay, can go to another page. Just do another page. Got a bit of time. Just give me any, any other page. What have you got? What are you looking at? What are you looking uh, at? 453. 453. Just look at page 453. Top one on the page. I'll just give it to you quickly. Four, uh, is the word... 453. Um, birds? Yeah. The la Let me give you the last one on the page. Just quickly get the last one on the page is... Birds, my fairy lord, this must be done with haste. Horses! Yeah. Yeah! Thank you so much! Thank you so much! I'll let you head now. Thank you very much, Johnny. That way, if you don't mind. Johnny, everybody! Thank you so much! <laughs> Please, you're enjoying it. Next, uh, next is, the, uh, is the rice. This is a bit of a weird one. Uh, the rice, right? 22. I have to pluck out 22 grains of rice from the bowl in one go. OK, so just to explain, if I got home early from school, I would, used to, and my parents were still at work, I'd go next door to Auntie Gwen's house, used to call her Auntie Gwen, and I'd ask to play with the rice. And she'd bring out like this big bowl of rice, or a big jar of rice, rather. She'd be in the kitchen, she'd call out numbers, and I'd have to pluck out that number of grains of rice in one go. I got really good at it. Got really good at it, and then I stopped doing it because of the whole dick brain thing, right? And then, but years later, when I was coming up with ideas for this show, I thought you might want to see this. So, for your entertainment, I will plug out 22 grains of rice from the bowl. Not 21, not 23, ladies and gentlemen, but 22 grains of rice from the bowl in one go. All right, so, uh, dick brain facts about 22. Uh, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 cards in the tarot deck. Joseph Heller wrote the book Catch 22 in 1961. It became a popular film in 1970. It was top of the cinema charts for uh, five weeks. Um, Paul Weller wrote the album called 22 Dreams, which contained 22 songs, including one called 22 Dreams. So there you go, some dick brain facts. 
about 22. Um, I do have to talcum powder my hands, otherwise the rice just, you know, kind of sticks. I don't have any control at all. I'm a little bit sick of hearing people say, oh, you just had the rice there and you just put in the rice in your hand. So, could somebody stand up here, just so you can verify, this is just talcum powder. Can you see that? Yeah. That's all that is. I'm not putting any rice in my hands. Are you happy with that? It's just so the rice doesn't stick, yes? Yeah, yeah. lovely, okay, thank you, good. All right, so, 22. 22 grains of rice from the bowl. Okay, here we go, come on then, come on. 22 grains of rice, come on, come on, come on, do it for mommy, here we go. 22 grains of rice from the bowl, here we go. 22 grains of rice from the, uh, from the bowl. 20, ah, uh, got one wrong, got one wrong. I'm one out, let me just move the bowl so you can see them. I'm one out, one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm not one out, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. There it is, 22 grains of rice. Thank you, Auntie Gwen. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> next, uh, next, okay, next is the human calculator. Human calculator, adding up numbers faster or as fast in my dick brain as you can on a calculator. Somebody got a 10-digit number now. Is there an usher with that person? Can you give me a wave if you've got a torch? Lovely, hopefully you've got a microphone as well. So can this person, you're gonna, right, you're gonna call out your 10-digit number in a moment. Now, you all have this number in your calculators. 4632642. Press plus. You're about to add to this number, generated by the dice, a 10-digit number written by somebody in the audience. All right? So when you get this, type it one digit at a time, then press equal, so you add them on your calculators. I'm gonna add them in my dick brain. Here we go. First uh, number, please. Go, nice and clearly, off you go. Seven. Seven, next. Nine. Nine, make sure you're all getting these. Two. Two, keep going. Nine. Nine again. Nine. 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 Nine, here we go. Seven. Oh, okay, seven. Two. Two, yep. Four. Four, last one. Six. Six, press equals, the total is 7,976,323,673. Am I right? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Good. Thank you. Next. Next. I just run out of time. Ah, oh, I did the extra page in the book. Ah, that's my fault. Okay, I was showing off. No, I, I, don't, I can't do two Rubik's Cubes behind my back in a minute, so I will do one Rubik's Cube. Maybe not, maybe not this one. I'll do the other one. Um, oh, whoever did these is a fucking sociopath, you can tell. <laughs> Okay, but behind my back, all right? Behind my back there, here we go, behind my back. One Rubik's Cube behind the back, here we go, here we go. <laughs> Went to see Darren Brown. 30 seconds. How was he? Yeah, he was all right. What was his big finale? He did a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> what a dick brain. Yes, he was, actually. It's funny you should say that. One uh, red cross there, green cross at the bottom, L shape there, 20. red L shape, that's it, done. Yes, yes? No, <sighs> no I... No, I Ten. have. I have. Look, Nine. I've matched Eight. that side to that Seven. side. Can you see that? Six. Five. And I've matched that Four. side to that side. Three. And that side to that two. side. And One. that side to that side. And those two match there. And those two match there. That's how a dick brain does a Rubik's cube. I'm a dick brain. I'm Darren Brown. Good night. Coming back through. <laughs> Amanda loves stand up, grab the microphone, love. Your grandma, she's she's come back for the end of the show, so I need a nice key yes or no from you, right? It's gonna be loud and clear. She's saying, I need a yes or no from you, your phone number. Is it oh oh is your phone number? Is it Oh, is your, is your phone number 07976-323668? Yes. Yeah, fuck me, I'm real! Good night! <laughs>
In each episode of this series, I will offer an applicant a blind choice of either a pleasant experience, a treat, or a darker trick. They won't know which one they've chosen, and they may not know how or when it will happen to them. All the applicants responded to advertisements. These are the six people that I've selected. They just don't know it yet. Welcome to Trick or Treat. <laughs> Tonight's applicant is Richard, a 20-year-old student from Wolverhampton. We've been observing him for the last few weeks to build up a profile and to monitor his movements to and from his flat. He lives a quiet and predictable life, which might be fun to shake up a bit. At 3 a.m. one morning in March, we've gathered outside his house, where he is hopefully asleep. His girlfriend has been persuaded to lend us a set of keys. I'm going to quietly break in and introduce myself. something nice. If you pick the one that says drink, it won't be. Okay. Okay? You won't know which one you've picked. You happy to play? Mm. Okay. You're going to sign this. For Richard's trick, I'm going to have him collapse asleep in London and wake up 1,500 miles away in Morocco with no explanation. And for that, I'll need his passport. He will have no memory of the journey or of any time having passed. More of Richard's adventure later. 
Meanwhile, I've met up with the League of Gentlemen for a discussion about fate and mini rolls. Hello. Hello there. Hi guys. Actually, would you grab a little chocolate roll from the uh, tray? From there here, then, certainly. Yep. Uh, there are five there, so if you can take one each, and if somebody can just put the last one in their pocket, that would be great. And come and sit down any chair that you like. Any, any one of these four. Hello, and how are you? Steve, pleasure, Hello. pleasure, 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 pleasure. Thank you, and uh, Jeremy, nice to meet you. Have you got the last one that wasn't chosen? In your pocket, great. Keep that in there for the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, well, look, thanks so much for coming out. Thanks for doing this. Um, I want to show you these. Um, there's four cards. There's something on the other side, but if you just mix them up for me, don't turn them over yet, and push them in the middle. If you can all just take one each, doesn't matter at the moment which one you take, but if you can just pull one towards you. On each card there's a message, and I want you just to have a look and memorise now the message that, that you've got. Done that? Yeah. Great, lovely, and I'll have those back. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Do any of you believe in fate at any level? Yes. Do you I do. Yeah. Yeah. I think things happen because they're meant to happen. I believe in summer fates, but no other. <laughs> I believe that we create our own destiny. Oh, you've got to come up with a different oh, belief not, system no. now. <laughs> no, 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 genuine, genuine. No, I don't, I don't, I don't do talk. comical answers to it, but I, <laughs> I think, yeah, I, yeah, I think I agree with Steve. I think you do. Your instinct often leads to exactly where you're meant to be. You superstitious fools. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's kind of about, it's about decisions, isn't it? Decisions that you make without sort of realising even that you're necessarily making decisions. And it's only in hindsight, you go, that, I suppose if I hadn't, you know, hadn't walked that way or gone to that party or met that person. Um, a bit like, for example, the chairs that you sat in, and I sort of made a point of saying, sit in any chair, and I presume you weren't thinking particularly about which chair you were going to sit in before you sat down. Or the choice of the cards that you picked, which again, I told you not really to think about it and just take them. And they all had a message on. Um, what was the message? What was your, what was your message? Uh, the, it was a colour. It said, I will choose blue. I will choose blue. Have you yeah. any idea what that refers to? Um, blue's my favourite colour. I'm wearing a You're blue wearing shirt. You're wearing a blue shirt? Perfect. The mini rolls are blue. It actually doesn't refer to any of those things. It refers to uh, a sheet of card that's underneath the cushion on your chair that you're, that you're sat on. And if you pull that out, you have to reach okay. under the cushion. Under the cushion. <laughs> yeah. Da da da. <laughs> Look at that. A blue sheet of card. <laughs> and uh, what did yours say, uh, Mark? Uh, I will choose green. Pull it out. And the card. And it out. <laughs> Very good. Jeremy, <laughs> just to see where this is going. Jeremy, yours said <laughs> I, will I will choose, choose yellow. yellow. That's right, take it out for me. <clears throat> Which leaves you with the red. Red. Really. Wow. Okay. Excellent. So, you see what I mean. And they've got a decisions that aren't important but you make them without thinking yes. about it. and this is kind of an area that I find interesting and it's also the good or bad consequences that you can avoid or things that you you never knew would have happened had you made different decisions and this, for me this goes back to and this is why the chocolates actually uh, I, I do play a role when I was um, about 10 I was in a supermarket queue with my mum and she bought these not these particular ones but uh, <laughs> and, uh, I was petitioning her to open them and eat them before we paid for them and she was getting a bit angry with me, a bit stressed and in her annoyance sort of ushered the lady behind us to come through ahead of us in the queue because she only had you know milk or something and then we all paid for our stuff and the woman went out, we went out, when we went out the, there was a crowd that was gathered in the car park and this woman who we'd allowed ahead of us had been hit by a car and she was laying on the, laying on the car park and um, so at the age of 10 I'm then going home thinking god if I hadn't have wanted to talk into those mini rolls, my mum wouldn't have let mm. that woman go ahead and would it have been my mum that got hit by the car and you start to kind of do those, to do those things in your head. Um, hence the mini rolls. Would you, and, and carefully if you don't mind, would you just open them and uh, <coughs> try not to break or touch the chocolate and just sort of um, put them on the plates. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. And again, did you think about which ones you took? There were five altogether, weren't there? So you've got, Jeremy, the last one in your pocket. But otherwise than that, you just sort of grabbed. Just you just grabbed Random. One. <clears throat> and you presume that they are indeed mini rolls. They look like mini rolls. They do, don't they? It could be razor blades. Could they? Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you just take a, take a bite out of them? <laughs> Gone. Gone. Nice big bite. <laughs> 
You're nothing wrong with them. Take a bite? Nice. <laughs> Jeremy, you should take a, a larger bite. There's a fish hook inside. <laughs> oh! Oh! What's that? Oh, what is what? that in there? What? I just something in there. No, 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 no. No, it's just sponge and cream. Yeah. <laughs> it's just no, the way he was eating it. He made it look like this. Hey, look at this mess. Yeah. No, that's fine. That's great. No, they, I, that's what I was yeah. hoping for. Excellent. So the last one, there was one left. You put one in your pocket, didn't you? You pull that out. Now look, um, you need to really carefully, Jeremy, just undo that and just so we don't confuse him. Don't just pass me your plates. Yeah. Get, get, get that out of the way. Okay. Okay, just on there? <laughs> Alright. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Why me? <laughs> <laughs> so look, before you do this, and do be careful, but you did just take any one. Yes. I would suggest you just take hold of the edges of it and just... Uh, Which way? Towards yeah, you? Yeah, either way, really. Just, just do be careful. Good gas. And again, I'd go a little bit further in. <laughs> careful. Look. Oh, oh Jesus. Dirty. Just, um... Get out with those. It is a razor blade, is it? Uh, it is. It is. Jesus. <laughs> Send it back. That wow. Is. There it is, look. Oh yeah, that's God. what I was, I was hoping it would be the one you didn't. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming on. Thank, thank you. you for, that. Pleasure. And Mark, for saving our lives. You're shaky. <laughs> and uh, Rhys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. That know. was literally just pick anyone, wasn't it? It was. There was no compulsion. There was no shenanigans. No. Totally random. We walked in in a random order, chose random chocolates, sat down in random chairs, so... And also, you would have ended up with two and you just picked... Well, one. I could have changed my mind at the last yeah. minute. And all sealed up and then within it. How, that's the thing, how do you get, how do you get it in there? Well, how like, do you get it in there? Don't know. I mean, and what, it's slightly irresponsible. Darren Brown not. Bakery. I knew it. <laughs> Since Richard picked the trick card, I now have license to shake up his regulated world. He's going to wake up in Marrakesh, somewhat outside his comfort zone, and this journey starts here. He's catching an early train to Waterloo, and we know he needs to get some passport photos urgently, so we're hoping he'll take the bait and step into the fake photo booth that we've set up. All the cameras are hidden. Patterns of light and sound are designed to send Richard plummeting into a catatonic state. Okay, let's get the van, let's get in there. Both Richard and our fake photo booth are embarking on an extraordinary journey. Now, I don't know how long he will remain asleep for, but for the first half hour or so, I talk gently to him to keep him in this state. We arrive at Heathrow Airport a bit late and apprehensive about the check-in. As it turns out, we get through check-in and security without a hitch, but the authorities don't allow filming after passport control. However, we do take a series of snaps throughout the journey. Any recognisable faces and logos are blurred. Richard is now sleeping very happily with no help from me.
In America's New York, I use my award-winning powers to plant a word in the slightly smaller American brain without anybody knowing how. Guys, you're free for a couple of minutes. Do you want to come and do this? Sure. It's a kind of a mind reading uh, okay. sort of experiment. Um, I need you to call somebody that you know. Okay. All right. Uh, does your cell phone have a, a speaker phone? Mm -hmm. It does? Yes. Excellent. Good. Do you want to get someone on? The, is there somebody you can call you think will be in? Right. What's this person's name? Joe. Okay. Well, if Joe isn't in, we can try someone else. Yeah. Is that on speaker at the moment? Yeah. Great, cool. Actually, if you want to hold it, if you hold it in your hand like that, then we'll both be able to hear it, and then Mike will be able to pick it up. Too. Joe? Yeah? Okay, just stay on the line and talk to me, okay? All right. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Uh, my name's Darren Brown. I'm a, I'm a kind of English psychological illusionist, if that makes any sense. And I want to try a, a kind of a mind-reading experiment with you, all right? All right. I need to ask you a few questions, Joe. I need to know a few things about you. Please be honest. How old are you, Joe? I'm 18. 18, fantastic. <coughs> and uh, do, are you a student? Do you work? or? I'm a student. Um, what, what do you study? What, what do you, are you at school or what, what do you major in? I actually go to culinary school. Culinary school, thank you. That's really interesting. Great. All right, listen, so I'm going to write something down here. I'm not going to show uh, Jessica or any of these guys what it is. Um, I'm going to ask you to be doing three things in a moment, all right? Joe, let me just explain. You're going to be uh, writing a word in your mind on like a big chalkboard. Uh, you're going to be saying the word to yourself over and over again. And then you're also going to try and do the whole thing without really thinking about it, all right? So that's three different kind of cogs that are going to be going round in your mind at the same time, all right? But let me just, uh, let me just write something here first. Okay. Okay, cool. Joe, I need you to imagine that you are, uh, you know, six years old back in elementary school, all right? And imagine you're picking up a piece of chalk. Okay. Then you're going to start writing a word very large and clear on this chalk board, and then just tell me when you're done. All right, I'm done. You're happy that was a, a free choice of word, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. See, I've written something here, and you won't be able to see what I've written, but hopefully you'll be able to tell by Jessica's reaction as to whether it's at all close. What was the word that you wrote? Bicycle. Bicycle. Tricycle! Oh! <laughs> yeah. Not bad! <laughs> Tricycle, yeah? That was one wheel out. Tricycle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Thanks for your help. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Well, I thought he was going to be completely wrong and it'd be like a complete sham, but then like he got tricycle. I'm pretty amazed, actually. I think he's psychic. Like, there's no other explanation for it, because how else would he go it? <laughs> Our participant, Richard, was offered a blind choice of trick or treat. His trick started when he collapsed in a photo booth in London. Although he doesn't know it, he and that photo booth have travelled 1,429 miles and are now in Marrakesh. He has been asleep for 13 hours, but when he awakes, not a second will have passed in his mind. Whilst he was asleep, an anonymous envelope containing his passport, his return flight details and some money were placed in his pocket. After a long and bizarre journey, which for him has simply never happened, Richard is about to receive his wake-up call. All cameras are very well hidden.
Hi. Um, where am I?